Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Reloved Guitars Workshop on a mm, blowy Friday afternoon. Uh, I'm Sam, your guitar fixing host, and um, for those who don't know what we do, we take basic budget guitars that uh, many learner guitarists get sick and tired of and in frustration put them onto eBay and sell them because the action and playability is terrible. And we buy them and do some work on them, do a secret combination of things, not a secret at all actually, but we do a combination of things which guarantees to turn all of these um, budget guitars into fantastic playing guitars. And it, the, the the beauty of it is, is that anything from an encore guitar up to a, a basic budget Squire Strat of any description can be made to play better than dozens of more expensive guitars that you can think of. Uh, and it's done by paying attention and doing the work necessary on a few core components of what we do, uh, what we call the uh, professional setup. Um, uh, one of them is to level the frets. And you may be surprised to know that um, we haven't yet come across a guitar in the workshop where the frets were level at any price range. Now that's that's something. So 100% of all of the guitars we've seen need the frets leveling. If you don't have the, if you don't start with level frets on your guitar, your action, your playing action, is compromised, uh, and you'll find it has to be set high to overcome the deficiencies in the frets. On top of that, uh, an area where of great fault, the second most important, uh, is the setting the nut uh, string slots to the correct depth. Now, if that's even half a millimeter out, and usually it's about a millimeter and a half out on guitars. Uh, then that will massively throw out your intonation. Sounds technical, but what it means is, um, even if you get a guitar set up that feels nice to play here, um, you tune it up perfectly with your tuner, and then you play an open chord, and it just sounds horrible. Right? And you can't quite put your finger on it, but everywhere you play open chords down this end of the neck, just sounds wrong. It feels hard to play, you're pressing down quite hard, uh, and it only starts to kind of sound right when you get back up here in bar, co bar chord land. The reason for that detuning down here is because um, when the slots are too shallow here, you have to press down too far on the strings, too hard on the strings, and it naturally pushes them sharp and out of tune. Um, settings at the bridge uh, are another cause of um, a bad playing action and an uncomfortable guitar. Uh, and then beyond that, just some little details, for example, like little details, major details like the tuners. If you've got rubbish tuners on your guitar and they slip out of tune very quickly, you will you will get sick of trying to play that guitar. It, there's nothing more um, demotivating and demoralising and uh, in guitar in trying to learn the guitar than a guitar that won't stay in tune. Now, if it doesn't stay in tune, there's only a couple of things it could be. It could be something wrong with the way the string passes through the nut uh, and Ultimately, it's down to the quality of the tuners and how the string fixes on the tuners. So we take care of all of those things so that what you get is a guitar that stays in tune and feels fantastic to play. And when you get hold of it, you'll be amazed how a guitar that costs very, very little can feel and outplay millions of guitars cost, costing tons more. Um, and although you may have heard me say this many times, but this work isn't done in the shop. Um, for most guitars. It, it, it probably is done for much higher cost guitars, um, but it's not cost effective for most guitar shops to do this work. It takes about three hours to do properly, um, sometimes longer if you hit other, uh, uncover other problems. Um, so it's just not cost effective for your average glossy guitar shop um, with its rack falls of racks, full walls festooned with beautiful guitars. Um, it's not feasible, financially feasible to do it. And, and it's not, if it's not feasible to do it in the shops, it certainly isn't feasible for the factories to do it. So your factories producing your Squire um, Affinity guitars, your, your really basic entry level um, Fender Squires, uh, just have, can't do it. Their business model can't afford to have somebody spend two or three hours minutely setting up all the parts of the guitar to make it play just perfectly. Um, often you'll be told, you'll get told a myth by um, unscrupulous sellers or shops or even factories manufacturers that the the tuning or not tuning the setup is left so that you can do it to your own satisfaction uh, that is nonsense right um, leaving the string action here through the through the nut 
way too high so that everything is out of tune is not leaving it for you as a, a learner guitarist to take care of that. You don't even know about that, so how can you take care of it? Um, and it's not the case that the manufacturer says, hey, spend 140 quid on our box set with a Telecaster and an amp, uh, but you must take it to a luthier and spend another £50 putting it right. They don't tell you that either. So they come out of the factory uh, with all those faults. And you know the great thing about doing this is we're finding that, um, we're, well, the simplest way is to say that we haven't found a single guitar yet without those faults. Which brings me right back to this beauty. Now, this is could be, uh, could be, I'm not sure, but this could be the only guitar so far to come through the Reloved Workshop that is perfect. Okay, now that's that's saying something. We've had a, all manner of Squire Stratocasters, we've had a Telecasters, we've had some fantastic vintage um, Les Paul copies. Uh, I've got quite a few weird and wonderful guitars inside as well. Not one of them has been set up correctly uh, and has not needed fret work and has not needed adjustment on the nut. Uh, or work on the tuners, for example. This is an incredible piece of um, equipment. And I'm going to tell you why. The first of all, it's made by John Hornby Skews. Now, you probably know John Hornby Skews for making a brand of guitar called Encore, um, of which I have a neck here, which I um, took off a guitar that was too horrible to carry on trying to uh, fix. Not that it couldn't be fixed, but I needed a, a neck to practice other things on. And you can see here I've been doing testing some different techniques. Um, and I've painted over. But underneath here is the Encore uh, logo. Um, same shape as this one. I don't know if you can see very well. Same, basic same shape. So this company, John Hornby Skews, very famous for, I think, decades of manufacture of um, basic uh, musical instruments for schools, I think made loads of brass instruments, um, wind instruments and so on. John Hornby Skews, British, used to be a British company, um, I think they may still be, um, but they manufacture it in China now, as do most people. Um, but JHS makes the basic Encore range. It makes a step up from this called the Encore Blaster, which is a very interesting guitar, slightly plasticky looking, but with some really, really interesting tonally rich um, guitar tech pickups in it. I really like it. Um, and then it makes a range of guitars above those called Vintage. And it pretty much has a, a copy in the Vintage range of every single major shape of guitar uh, that you're likely to find. So of course this is one of the Vintage Strats, um, Strat variants. I am not actually sure, I have to confess, I'm not entirely sure what model this is because if you go and look for Vintage you'll see their promotional material tells you in the Strat range they have things called the um, Vintage Reissued Strat, they have the Vintage Icon series of which they have a Strat uh, amongst others and then they have a Vintage uh, Advance, Vintage Advance series of which I've got one uh, in the house. Um, but this one hasn't got any other identifying numbering or anything on there and I haven't really dug too deeply but so I don't know what its sort of designated model number is but what I do know is it's exactly on a par with the vintage icons or the vintage reissue straps. First thing about it is um, unlike the Encore series this is a solid piece of hardwood a nice weight absolutely perfect strap weight um, you can tell straight away this is a quality guitar by the finish of the lacquer it is a rich, deep, orangey, yellow um, vintage feel, so there's no kind of expense spared. And in fact, it, I can't really tell the difference between this finish and my 1983 Squire JV Strat in the house. Um, they're almost identical, except for the fact that my JV Strat is starting to flake up and down this neck um, with age. But apart from that, they feel identical, and actually they don't feel hardly any different from each other in terms of the, the neck itself. So it has a, a beautiful, um, thick, yellowy, vintage finish, oh, which I'm going to bash off. <laughs> um, it has uh, Wilkinson um, components, and Wilkinson is the uh, Trevor Wilkinson is the designer, the guitar designer behind all of the John Hornby skews. So at some point in their history, they got this guy Trevor Wilkinson into kind of 
um, revamped the whole, all their brand ranges, uh, all their all their model ranges, and he's done it fantastically, fantastically well with incredible quality products and innovation, uh, innovative products as well. And every every um, Wilkinson product you find, every component that's made by Wilkinson, every guitar that's put together by Wilkinson. Um, you just keep finding a little innovation after little innovation. And I'll give you an example. This morning, I put, I replaced the tuners on this, I'm probably going to leave that on for a second. So I replaced these tuners on this vintage um, Cherry Sunburst, uh, what do you call it, Les Paul copy. Um, and I, I, one of them was faulty from the buyer uh, who sold it to the seller I bought it from. So... I figured, look, I can't sell it with that on it, even if I put a great setup on it. It was working. I got it back to working, but it just didn't feel right to send it out. Nice guitar like this out with a, um, a faulty tuner. So what I did was I bought a set, this set of uh, Wilkinson tuners, to replace the originals. And they look identical, except these are a slight upgrade. And they are the Easy Lock tuners, which, unlike the ones they replaced, but like the ones on this Strat here, are innovative because they have... The, po the post has two holes in it at 90 degrees and the idea is you, um, when you're th threading, uh, stringing your guitar, you pass the string through the hole, pull it taut, wrap it around 90 degrees, pull it tight, tune it up, snip the end off and that's it. So you never ha have overloaded posts anymore. And better yet, what you have is a, uh, an arrangement that keeps your strings in tune, amazingly well in tune. So in one half hour of putting these babies on this this morning, uh, I've, I've changed the way it stays in tune um, and I and actually that's one of the upgrades I, I'm starting to put more and more on things like the Fender guitars so I'm putting Wilkinson tuners on the Fenders um, so the point about this is that these are easy lock tuners and that little tiny innovation um, is one example with the two holes it's, it's, it transforms the tuning stability of the guitar um, and it's no more expensive or or, or um, uh, yeah, just literally, no, no more expensive than any other kinds of decent quality tuners. But it holds the tuning far better because of that innovation. And another teeny weeny little innovation that I really loved this morning is when I got these uh, tuners, because they're a set of tuners sold on their own, Wilkinson's know that you're going to be adding them to a, an existing guitar, more than likely, or to a new build you're making yourself. So what they do is that the, the little screws that came with it were slightly, marginally bigger than the ones I took out with effectively the same tuners, uh, but slightly different model, but you know what looked like the same set of tuners that I took off. And that meant that instead of spinning the uh, screw in a hole that already had a screw exactly that size in it, that little innovation thought through meant that these... Uh, screws went in a little more snugly than the previous ones, meaning that even though I'd replaced them, they've still fitted and held the, uh, the tuners in place. I think that that example of detail being thought through by somebody making uh, equipment for the guitarist or the, um, the guitar builder or, or um, guitar setter-upper like myself is just incredible. And that is what characterises the Wilkinson touch as found on all these JHS guitars. So here we are uh, with this strap. I'm going to get rid of the, the encore neck. Here we are with our basic strap. And when I bought this guitar, um, I will I will say how much I got paid for this one. I don't like to normally say say what that is because it's, it's all always a matter of luck on eBay. But I want you to get a sense of this because there's a kind of a, a shame, a tragedy in this story as well as a, an amazing thing in this story. I, I found this uh, on an eBay, buy it now for £30 up in London and I went to, uh, I bought it immediately, went to pick it up because I know the quality of these guitars. That's the plus side. The downside is not many people also, uh, not many buyers know the quality of these guitars uh, and are, are, I think buyers are often more tempted by the, the Fender um, Squire branding because they feel in safer territory. The, the vintage is often unknown to them and maybe they associate it with Encore and think it's something like they had at school. Um, but I know the quality of these things, so 30 quid was a bargain. I went to pick it up. The guy, lovely guy up in, um, near Uxbridge Way, um, Osterley or somewhere, um, 
met me, picked me up in his car at the tube station, took me to his house, let me try it out, brought me back to the station, all for nothing, just for having bought this guitar for 30 quid. And I, could, I knew straight away what a nice find it was. So it is a beautiful looking thing. It plays fantastically. The, the um, basic, very basic um, tremolo works and leaves it back in tune at the end of it, which is rare, but it does that because of the stability of the tuners and the nut together. All right. So it's those two things that make that tremolo usable. Hence, I've still got it attached. It has three Wilkinson single coil pickups, but these are made with Alnico magnets. Um, and to my mind, they're great really great sounding they're not they're not hysterical or they don't jump out a mile and and i'm not a pickup connoisseur but they are a really usable tone as far as i'm concerned and i've got no complaints about them uh, standard five-way switch no fancy electrics just everything works the way it should um no no branding or numbers on the plate on the neck <sighs> a bit dirty because i've put it down on here um I've just suddenly realised the plastic is still on this thing and I never leave the plastic on. But we'll, to, to do our job on this guitar, I'm going to take it all apart, which is a bit of a shame because it's bloody perfect. So the question here is, um, this is the, the issue for me is this is the only guitar I'm happy to play without doing anything to it. But I want to make it better than it already is, and it is fantastic already. There is some room to be had in the um, string action over the nut, which we could do without taking the neck off or the strings off. There is, um, the bridge uh, settings are in a nice radius already, reflecting the radius of the guitar neck. Um, and without um, taking the strings off and having a look at the neck in a bit more detail, we don't really know what the state of the frets are like. I mean, they're very clean, this guitar is very new, um, but I want to see whether this guitar has level frets or whether it suffers from the same kinds of frets so it's more it's more background or research for me than anything it doesn't really need to be taken apart or done anything to so you can see i think this guy bought this didn't even play it there are, there aren't even any scratches anywhere on the body the wrapper's still cellophane's still on the back here um, and i've bought it because somebody is in slightly hard times and that's how it goes on ebay but these things um this is Pound for pound, this is, uh, I've said it many times, this guitar, if you could just get your hands on this and then play it next to a squire of any persuasion, I promise you, like me, you would immediately get the quality of this guitar that is way above the strats. And yet, this doesn't seem to command anywhere near the price because people don't know the brand. So my, my aim, or what I'd like to do, is to change that. Uh, through partly through what I'm doing at We Love Guitars, because I think these 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 are a far better bargain or, or proposition for a learner guitar. If you could, like me, if you could find one of these for fifty or sixty pounds, and if they actually came out of the factory in the condition this is in, which, judging by the person who owned it before the fact, it's practically brand new. It's it strongly suggests this was either set up correctly in the factory or in the shop. Um, uh, but either which way, it's a, it's a, it's this is a guitar that would not put you off learning. That's the amazing thing. Um, and even just about every single one of the squires that I've had through uh, it, it is more or less badly set up. Has been more or less badly set up, and could quickly conspire to make you feel like you're getting nowhere with your learning. So I'm going to. Um, take this guitar apart and we're going to just have a look inside just for kind of interest sake oh well that's a pull out all right lovely simple thing it grips it naturally on its own and i can just pull it out and get rid of it no screw-ins or anything that's a nice finished one okay um these strings are pretty good condition so um i probably want to keep them store them somewhere else but uh yeah, so vintage Stratocaster. Uh, if you ever see one for anything like the money I paid for this, then you must get yourself one because they really are quality that stands out a mile. And it's not just I'm not just saying that because um, you know there's, there's something unusual or special about them. 
you can see this is about as ordinary a strat as you could possibly get anywhere. Um, but it's a, it's a strat where the, even the tuners, for example, are e easily as good quality as the ones on my original Japanese um, JV Squire. Um, and that, for a guitar that cost me next to nothing, but I mean, th these, uh, the reality about these uh, vintages is they sell anywhere from between 190-ish to a list price somewhere like 250-ish. So, um, you know, they weren't, they weren't dirt cheap when they, or they aren't dirt cheap, cheap to buy new. And actually, in all the reviews I've ever read of them, the reviewers state that in their view they are worth twice the money that you pay for them because they are that good. Um, the fact then that you can get them out in the world at a fraction of the price uh, that they list at is just amazing. Um, just amazing. And you, you know, you are in the realms of a fantastic bargain. Now, of course, the, the if it if the, the brand became better known and they had a better price uh, online because there was more demand for them, then of course you, you wouldn't get such a good bargain for your money. But um, right now, while things are as they are, I would highly recommend everybody tries one of these at, at least once before you start kind of putting your money into Squire uh, Strats or even going up to Mexican or um, uh, just, you know, even even the cheaper, yeah, the cheaper low-end um, fenders. This this, I think this is on a par quality-wise with a basic fender. That's my take. Um, now the one thing I don't have quite as good a, 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 a much an experience of is whether the the sound or the pickups are uh, in the same league. Um, but I've got no reason to believe they're not good, and you know for, they're certainly good for me to listen to. And most reviewers uh, seem to have good things to say about the Wilkinson pickups, um, and they've put a lot of time and effort into developing pickups and making them good for their guitars. So um, this is, if you're serious about your music, this is, this is definitely a brand to be giving some serious time to. Whether or not, um, I don't know who stocks them or where you'll find them, um, but you know, take my word for it, they are certainly worth investigating. So I've got a whole pile of spare strings here which are all useful for um, putting necks under load and testing them. Um, okay, so there's nothing wrong with the tunes on this guitar, so I'm not even gonna take those off. I am gonna remove the neck because I want to see the um, Let's have a look at it and see the state of the, uh, the inside because I'm nosy as much as anything else. Um, as with all things, if you're taking the, the neck off, two things really. Get sure you've got the right screwdriver bit for it. You don't want to strip it. And also, when you take it off, be conscious there may be a, a, a shim in place under there in a particular position. And if there is, you need to get your neck very gently off and mark the position of the shim or photograph it so you know where to put it back. Um, otherwise, everything will change when you come to uh, reassemble the neck. So as I said, I, I have a sneaky feeling. Judging only by how it feels to play, my suspicion is that this... Uh, this neck may not have any fret problems, or if it does, it has very few. Um, I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it does, because, because as I've said, not a single guitar that we've ever done in here in the workshop has been free of fret problems. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised that it does have, if it, if it does have fret problems. Um, but I have a sneaky suspicion, based on how well it plays, that in fact it might not, and I'd be, I'd be quite happy to be proved right in that respect. And um, before I take the neck off while I'm here, I'm just going to take off this, this plate and just have a look at what we've got. Um, as I say, the telltale signs about the newness is the plastic is still on here. And 
I'm, I'm very tempted in two minds with this guitar whether to keep it or sell it. Um, if I do sell it, I will sell it for a, uh, a reasonable market price. Um, you know, it's, it's one of these things. If, if I manage to get this at a, an incredibly bargain price, then that's sort of our good fortune. I, I don't necessarily, I won't necessarily put that out into the world at, at exactly the same price because, you know, that's. That's the kind of payoff you get for finding the right thing at the right time is getting a little bit more um, payback or profit from it because you got you got a good deal. Um, so what we've got straight away we can see in the back of here. Um, I'll show you in a minute. Let's just do the neck thing first. So the neck comes off nicely and I'm looking under here and there's not a single uh, shim or anything to be worried about so I can just leave that to one side. One of the reasons you, for taking the neck off is you can do things like take off this little piece of plastic which lives and or was left over underneath the lip on the neck um, and there's, there'll be a few more around as well. Somebody's tried to do that with a knife and they've left a little scratch but it's not visible because it lives under this uh, the, the little lip on the neck. So just a quick look at it. Um, beautiful colour, lovely vintage yellow aged colour, great condition, nice wood, um, it'll be, uh, I, whether or not it's um, maple or who, who knows, it'll be a Chinese um, variant that does the same job at, at the same kind of quality. I know that much about um, vintage guitars, one of the reasons they are so good, such good value is that um, they source their woods in China where they manufacture them and as a result they are they keep the prices um, really good. Okay, so we have, um, what have we got here? Let's have a quick look under the hood. There was something else I was going to show you. Oh yeah, what we've got here is what looks like a very, very substantial uh, tremolo block. And it looks like a steel, a big steel block. Again, you can tell that the quality of that guitar just from looking at that tremolo block. If you go into the back of the fender, in fact, I will have one here to show you. There. Uh, yep, Squire Strat Bridge Saddles. So this is a... I can't remember what guitar this came off now. But look at, look at, look at the size of this piece. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a very soft um, steel and you can tell because the tremolo arm has broken it away on the inside. So you don't want that in there. So this is a squire, this is squire, Chinese squire quality. So you've got your bridge saddles in there. Um, the bit that comes through the back, compared to what we've just seen, has been reduced in size. Uh, it's now a kind of a, a bit like a cast um, cast iron almost, but it's a it's a some sort of low grade metal that get, gets easily bent out of shape by and broken by the. Um, tremolo arm. So that's what? Four or five millimetres thick. Just enough to fit the springs in. And you go back to this baby and look at that thing. Black, it's hard to see, but that's twice the thickness and I think it's made of a, uh, a much harder steel as well. Much more solid and weighty steel. So there's one of the differences, major differences in quality. Um, you know, and who would ever know except somebody looking for a really, really good quality guitar. Now, for the time being, um, I'm not going to do anything. I know everything under here works, so there's nothing I can improve by taking this apart. So actually, that's not going to be the focus of my attention. There's nothing I, I need to see. There won't be any fancy circuitry or surprising circuitry under there. It's just a good old-fashioned um, single coil, three single coils um, wired up with a five-way switch. So. Uh, I mean, if we looked under there, you might be surprised to see really good quality wiring. So maybe I will. What the hell? Since we're here, eh? I, I, I guess what I'm partly trying to do here is give you a really, a really good sense of just how good a quality these things are. Because if you, um, if you've never had a chance to stop and look at them or have never been tempted to 
stop and look closely at them because perhaps you're somebody who really cares most about brand names, then why would you have a look? Um, but these things are spectacularly good quality. Okay, so I'm never going to pull too hard on these things because um, for the simple reason that the um, on a well-made guitar the, the spare wiring is always minimal. There's never much left over for you to pull on. Um, and in the case here, there's not a lot of room. But what I can see straight under there is we've got the um, Wilkinson WVSN pickups here. And each one of them has a braided wire. That's a good, a real sign of quality as well. Braided wire coming through. Fairly standard everything else. The, the pots look normal, um, standard. Um, but the qualities in the pickups and the wiring that goes from the pickups to the switch um, is pretty good. And the body is routed for three single coils, so it's not, uh, it's not, it's got a lot of weight, good, sort of nice solid weight to it because it's not all, it's not all drill, um, routed out for you know, various uh, humbucking combinations that some of the, the squares are, certainly the affinity strats. So, really tidy innards, um, good quality pickups, good quality wiring. Nice, way better wiring, I have to say, than most of the strats, uh, the square strats. So there's a scores on there as well. Don't forget, given that if you look on, if you look at um, many of these strats, square strats being sold on eBay, you will notice a, a great way to tell. I mean, to, a great way to tell the overall quality is. Well, if you know it's a Squire Strat, the basic components are decent enough, um, but what you'll get is a pretty lousy setup. When you open up a vintage like this, what you'll see straight away is an increase in quality in all the components. So better machine heads than any uh, Squire Strat, these things, these, these easy lock, two hole system and the, just the quality of those um, oval tuners, they're solid, they're, they're, they go around um, without any clicking or anything, they're really solid and direct and positive. Those beat any Squire Strat of any model, they beat the standards, the lot, these are far higher quality. The neck, the lacquer is a far higher quality of any Strat, uh, Squire Strat, and the electrics, the wiring, um, and the tremolo block. So can, you can see straight away we're winning, this guitar is winning hands down on any uh, square strat you can name or find on eBay. And yet, if you look at the um, strats on eBay, many of them will be selling for, trying to try to sell for 90 odd quid. Um, and if you look at them, you'll see that many of them are still equipped. Some Even the ones that people are trying to get £100 for, equipped with these basic mass-produced, I mean they're all mass-produced, but these basic cheapest of all uh, pressed metal tuners with the little covers. Um, and, and those come on even some of the most expensive Squire strats that you can find. Um, right up there in the bullet range usually has them, the Affinity sometimes has them. So, you know, these pickups here on this guitar that I paid £30 for, a million times higher quality than these. And so one of the things I'm doing now more and more with Relove Guitars is replacing any Fender supplied tuners or Squire supplied tuners, apart from the most stable, with um, Wilkinson Easy Lock. Because on the basis that a guitar that you're going to live with is one that stays in tune. And that's why this beastie on its own, without doing anything to it, not only wins out in quality of all the components we've looked at so far, but in terms of the fact that the tuners here will keep this guitar in tune. And it just makes it a guitar you want to pick up again and again. And that's why I'm really not sure whether I want to sell it or not. So um, the good thing for me is I know there are loads out there. And it's not difficult to find. So I've, I, for example, I just sold a, a, a reloved um, Squire standard. 
which is a really a nice basic platform for doing modifications. And I sold it with no major modifications, just a really good setup, and it turned it into a lovely guitar. And I sold that for, um, I think it was 165 on eBay. Um, I go on eBay looking for another one, um, and you can't find them for under about 180. So mine was cheap, even with the the um, setup work included. But there is no way that the basic unset up bog standard Squire Strat standard is worth 180 quid plus when this thing it doesn't even get a look in. This is massively better even than that guitar. So if you find one of these for under £100, jump on it. That's my advice. Right, we've had a good look. We know this thing, even the feel of this, is just great. Just a lovely, solid thing. And I'm going to put this somewhere out of the way um, where it's not going to come into any harm. And actually, I think what I'm going to do is find some uh, cable to hang it up out of our way for the time being. Um, just so that it doesn't come into any come to any harm. Um, in, in the real life workshop, there are some odd ways of doing things, but hanging things up on bits of wires is is my way of making sure that they don't get kicked over. Um, I've already knocked too many of my own guitars over in the past to you know, take that risk. So this isn't isn't the most super efficient way of doing things, but it's enough for a temporary. Um, temporary hold and um, to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. I tend to put some tape on it which has now gone for a walk somewhere. So if I can't find tape I will use something else. I wouldn't mind getting hold of uh, a few dozen of those wonderful, um, what do they call them, Hercules guitar hangers. Um, they're quite, now they're so popular they've gone up in price. They used to be very, very cheap when I first came across them. Um, but having gone up in price, they then, you know, everyone started to realise they were the bee's knees when it came to um, storing guitars or presenting guitars or keeping them safe from damage. So, um, they've gone up in price, so difficult to afford too many of them around the house since we've already got quite a few. Hello. I'm just taking apart the uh, the world's most wonderful. Um, what do we call it? This one, vintage. Yeah, I'm talking to the camera actually. I'm talking to the, the future vintage owners of Great Britain. People, people who hopefully will be persuaded by my passion for vintage as a brand. Okay, I'm going to take a break for a cup of tea. We will return... Stop. We will return to do the all-important checking on this neck. What's the odds? Level frets or problems? Level frets or problems? I think, I sneakily believe, this is going to have level frets. Just one thing, I did say it was practically new, but there is some fret wear down here, so... That makes a monkey out of my idea that it was brand new. So whoever's had it has treated it very well. Okay, back in a minute. Hey, welcome back. Oh, that wasn't there before. Okay, so we're going to take a look at the wonderful neck um, on this vintage guitar, which in the late afternoon sun is looking even antiquer than it was before. But yeah, you can see it's a very very good looking finish. I mean, that's kind of nice. Nice golden yellow. I've got um, somebody here who's taking advantage of the warm uh, workshop lights. Aren't you, Mrs? So she might have to move in a minute. Hey? Yes? Okay. Well, let's see if we can work around her. Um, so the first thing we have to do when we come to checking the fret. Uh, level or checking the levelness of the frets is we need to make sure that we start with uh, a neck that is straight okay so um, and to, to make sure it's straight we need to look down the length of the neck and look to see whether there's any um, con 
convexity or concavity. So was it shaped like that? Was it shaped like that? Um, in this case, the neck is just slightly convex, um, and I'd want to set that slightly down to make sure that we have the right shape on the neck before we try and uh, assess our frets. Um, so, okay, and I have it written down somewhere the way this works, and I always uh, lose track of it. <coughs> so, if we got a slightly um, concave, sorry, convex neck, and we want to take that convex out shape out of it, uh, we can turn the um, turn the truss rod counterclockwise, which we're going to do with this. Um, Now truss rods are weird as anything, um, a lot of people are frightened to touch them, and I know I was in, in the past, um, because they're sort of slightly mysterious and don't know, nobody really knows what they do. Um, also because some of them, uh, and I found many of these on, on Reloved Guitars, um, many of them are, by the time you get them, broken, so that they spin in one direction and don't do anything, but when you turn them in the other direction actually do something and if that's the case there's not a lot you can do um, on a budget guitar uh, because it doesn't it's not really economical to take the neck apart and try and replace it with a new truss rod a, a, a very good sign is on this one I could feel straight away that that was um, turning it was very stiff but moving so a tiny little bit of turn on this guitar uh, on this truss rod has straightened that neck out as far as I'm concerned, perfectly. Um, so we can we can carry on. So the object of the exercise when you're checking for level frets is to um, is what we're looking to do. There's a couple of things, a couple of ways we can look at this. To, to achieve level frets on a guitar, you don't necessarily need to check the individual frets. You can just say to yourself, right, I'm going to use a fret leveling file of something like this or very many variant side but you can say I'm going to use a fret leveling file and I'm just going to level all of them uh, together and once so long as my neck is straight to begin with then they will all end up at the same height because of the nature of this flat surface here um, but I'm always interested to find out which frets are actually high and which aren't before I do it because on the basis that if only one turns out to be high then actually there's no real need for doing all of this, you create a lot of extra work. Um, however, if your frets are really significantly worn anyway, you might as well use that technique because it will get rid of all the grooves. Now I know for a fact, having um, had a quick look at this before, I can tell that there is some, actually surprisingly, given such a good condition guitar, there is some fairly, well, there's the beginnings of some wear there where the strings pressing in and wearing the frets which suggests to me for a guitar of such good condition and which feels quite new suggests that either um, the frets are soft metal or that this guitar has been kept and played by an incredibly um, careful owner um, either which way there is a bit of wear there so uh, if there's lots of uneven frets then great because a complete level will take out this wear as well. If we do the check and then there's only one say one fret with a high, uh, high fret in the whole thing I will think I will probably leave the wear on these rather than level the whole lot and I'll just attend to one fret. Um, I, I was watching a video um, earlier on uh, where somebody uh, some people recommend fixing high frets by hitting them with a little rubber hammer um, and you can do that and often it works, you're just pushing the fret further down into the wood. But the problem with that for me is that it's, first of all, it's not, um, it's not accurate. How do you know how far you've pressed the fret in? You might know that you've, you've made it no longer high, but is it lower or higher than anything else? So it's not accurate. And also, my feeling is if you bash in the fret with a hammer here, um, I think chances are you're going to break the glue seal more, in, more than anything else and run the risk of frets coming out again. People differ on that. Um, I'm, I don't have monopoly on that view. Just, to, just I don't, I don't like the thought of doing it that way, so I do it the other way. So it's just as a quick example. Let's get a quick taster. We will, we use a, a fret rocker to check for um, whether frets are level in in relation to each other, 
and the fret rocker is a piece of metal with various flat straight edges on it um, and they're different lengths so that the idea is that you only use it to cover three frets at once so three frets down this end is a certain distance apart then you need to change to a short shorter distance as you move up finally ending end up with three frets underneath the um, shortest length now I said that my feeling was that this this neck is perfect that's my theory and I'm going to test it now ah you hear that clicking that means we've got a high fret on the third fret now I'm just going to I'm going to mark it since we're doing it uh, if, if I get a quite a lot of um, high frets on here and what I'm going to do is I'm going to well sorry not, not if uh, either which way um, when I've so that's not what I wanted to do I didn't want to get mark a pen onto the neck I'm taking a shortcut so strike that and reverse it I'm going to mask off the neck since I know already that there is a um, there's a high fret and we're going to do some work on the neck I'm now going to do what I normally do anyway um, is going to use masking tape to protect this neck because it's such a nice guitar I don't want to go and uh, damage the neck so I get myself a, a piece of wood if I can just get this old masking tape off it get myself a piece of wood and I'm going to cut some strips of tape good old fashioned masking tape will do this job and um, you need, you need different kinds of sizes of tape as you go further up the neck because the fret, fret just, the space between the frets gets smaller. Um, what works at the one end of the neck doesn't neck doesn't work at the other. So, so to begin with, I will go for I will have a few full size bits of masking tape, and then I'll cut go to, go to cut them in half. So what will I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, let's think that. Cut this second one in half. It's not very easy to cut actually, but I'm going to cut them to manageable lengths for the job at hand. And then just go start putting them on. And the, the idea is to butt them right up to the, the fret um, to protect make sure there's no wood sticking through. It's a different quality of masking tape than I usually use actually. This is bought from the market. The last roll I had was, um, was one from work. Um, I had in my bag. But, okay, I could use another set of full-size ones. So then this takes a little while to do. Um, some people think that you can just use, or some people like to just use a fret, fret protector strip, which um, I don't know where it's gone now. I've put it in one of these things. Um, the little metal strip that you can use to, where's it gone? Uh, you can use to just lay over the fret and protect the wood underneath. Um, I think that's quite hard. I found it quite hard to use. It's, it's effective, but to do the whole neck with it, it means you end up, I found I ended up using a lot of energy just holding that piece of metal in place. Um, whereas you tend to find that you want all your, all your free energy for uh, kind of working on the metal itself instead of holding a little piece of uh, protector strip that's trying to go all over the place. But anyway, so the, the idea is we, we mask off the whole neck and making sure that everything is covered. Um, too nice a guitar, all guitars are too nice a guitar to, uh, to take any shortcuts at this point. Um, but we know that we've, we've proved then straight away that the, the vintage guitar, despite playing really well, has a, a, a noticeably high fret. Um, and I suspect we'll have several more. And the thing is about guitars is that will all 
they all have high frets when they come out of factories because the way the frets are put in isn't scientific and there's no way that the way in which they're put in can result in a completely level set of frets. It isn't possible. This is a bunch of little pieces of metal that you're um, squeezing with a tool or a machine, squeezing into place into a pre-cut groove in the wood. Um, and, you know, they're going to go in and stick at different levels and um, and the only way to achieve a, a all over leveling would be to do what we're doing now. And as you can see that this, I like the way that this guitar played before we did this. So by no means is this an absolute essential job. Um, a guitar like this vintage was playing very well beforehand and would carry on playing forever. But what the fret leveling will do well, it'll give us more leeway on the action we can have on the guitar. Um, because that what, what you usually find is when you have high frets, that the, the, the main impact is that it restricts the, how low you can set the, put the um, string action. Uh, and sometimes it just happens to be playable, it happens to be quite nice, and you can live with it. Um, but taking care or doing a, a setup like this, what it will do is give us back a range of settings that we, um, we wouldn't otherwise have. So that's why I like to do it. For, for a guitar like this vintage, um, the improvement will be good, um, it will be, it'll be noticeable, um, but it's not essential to make it play because it was quite a nice guitar to play before. For most of the budget guitars that we get through here, well, not most. Many of the budget guitars, a majority of the budget guitars that we get here, um, are verging on the unplayable in the state that we get them. So a second-hand guitar bought from eBay um, very often is you, you pick it up and you notice that it's got an action of about six, seven millimetres, sometimes even as high as a centimetre. Um, and, you know, those guitars are practically unplayable. Um, There are millions of them about. Oh, I wondered. Cut. Oh, somebody just leaving us. Carry on. Right, so that's done. Okay, so we have a beautifully masked off guitar neck, nicely straightened. Um, and ready to check and mark uh, for the evenness of the frets. And what I will do, I've learned this the hard way, I'm just going to go down and mask off these side bits as well because in previous jobs I found that the permanent marker pen can sometimes run down the side and stain uh, the lacquer, which is really annoying thing to do when you've taken such a long good time to clean up your um, fretboard you don't want to end up covering it with marker pen. Right, okay, so we go now to our level testing with our rocker and our pen. So we discovered we have some uneven fret here on this one, so we'll mark that. And at the same time, we'll mark the, uh, the masking tape next to it. And the reason we do that is that a bit later on, we will take the top off these uneven um, frets and we'll take away that black marker. So we'll keep it on the paper so we'll know where we've done it. So that one's high as well. So 
have a little bit, a little bit of high spot in there. So it keeps um, keeps those statistics up. Still, 100% of guitars coming through here have fret level problems. I was hoping it would be this one that would prove me wrong, but it isn't. There we go, even more. This one confirms it. Not so many, and I would say considerably fewer, quite a, quite a lot fewer than most of the squires. A lot fewer, but still some. Um, you know, and, and we haven't got through yet, but still more than more than you'd want. Given the, um, the fact that there there are a number of high frets, although not not substantially high, but nonetheless there are some high spots. This this alone might make me feel like um, possibly borderline doing it with a, a block of. Um, a block and some sandpaper is one way of doing this, um, but given that there are there's some wear on these frets anyway, um, and then pretty much 50% of the remaining frets have got some high spots, it starts to suggest to me that it probably makes sense to do it all in one go with the fret leveling file. Um, so it's a decision you have to make as you go along, and it's not there's no exact set of circumstances that makes you decide, right, this is definitely a combination of things. I'm just going to put a bit more masking tape on this edge here, which is starting to come off. Nearly there. It's pretty much all the way across this whole front here. So that's the end result of this check. As you can see, it's a well. You can see there's so there's, there's a fair bit of um, uneven frets, a fair few uneven frets on here. But as I've said, it is quite a lot less than most of the Squire necks that I've come across. But there you go. Um, so I'm going to use the fret leveling file to do this um, and it's fairly simple to use. Uh, I'm going to just support the neck a little bit here and I'm going to use the file all the way along the length of this um, and it's going to take a little bit off everything including the, the frets that um, don't have high spots but it will take 
more off the ones that do, then the net result it will bring them all down to the same level. Okay, so we just place the thing, fair, not too much pressure, you don't want it chattering, but we just run along right to the end and then move in a little bit right to the end across to the middle a bit of chattering there which we didn't want and then I'm just going to quickly eyeball everything I've done and if I see some spots that don't appear to be touched I'll just go over again with my um, file. What the hell was that? Oh that's not so good. That piece of string off cut somehow got caught to under here. I don't know if it's not even magnetic but it's got caught under there and I've scraped it on one of these frets. Luckily I've um, not made any mark thankfully. Um, okay. So that's that's pretty much that done. Um, I can see everywhere I've made a mark with the marker pen uh, the fret leveling file has taken that height down. Um, we've also got quite a bit of dust on there so it'd be a good idea to brush that off so it don't grind it into the fretboard or anywhere else. Um, a way of checking now to see whether those high spots have gone is to go back over the same stuff, uh, same spots with um, our fret rocker and just run those checks again. Right, so there's a bit at the edge there which hasn't hasn't done so I'm just going to take that quickly over the edge and just check it again. Still not quite there. Again, sometimes you'll find that it's the edges that give the most trouble just because the, the file doesn't really tend to want to go to the edge when you're using it. Um, or it's, it's hard to run the file right to the edge, I should say. The file doesn't mind where it goes. Um, The, uh, the little gap I had there in the video was um, occasioned by a call I received from uh, somebody connected with a rather nasty business scam that for a number of years I've had a site that helps people uh, who've been caught by this particular scam not to pay uh, the money that's being extorted out of them. And uh, this person who called me is somebody who has appeared in one of these groups claiming to be somebody and then somebody's claimed that he's someone else and, um, and he's trying to get me into a dialogue about why I should publish his things about the scam on this particular site. And, and actually what I tried to explain to him there was that it doesn't matter, the site does the work it does and it has the effect it has without needing to explain all his stuff so it was, it was like he was talking to some mistaking me for somebody who gave a damn as they say in Hollywood right so there we have all of the frets now level um, and what we're left with is a whole neck full of frets that need um, dressing and that means they at the moment they've got a flat top and um, the guitar doesn't play very well with strings trying to go across a, a flat um, profile so what we need to do is reshape the fret to its original nice rounded shape but we don't want to lower the fret anymore while we're doing that so we have to find a way of um, shaping the fret and retaining the, the top uppermost surface as the high point uh, but getting rid of the, the sort of flat level shelf that it's on and we do that by using um, 
either a manual method using a three-sided or triangular file or we do it this time using a new tool that we've bought recently and this is the um, this is this little thing from Chris Alsop guitars um, and normally historically I would uh, do this job by taking a file and um, just rounding off each side of the fret to leave only a thin little black line of mar um, marker pen across the middle of each fret which would tell me that I'd rounded off the edges but I'd left the top untouched. This thing that I bought for 25 quid um, is quite expensive for a little tool but actually it's made by a guitar maker who knows what he's doing and actually this makes that job a lot easier. So I'm going to, for the first time I'm going to put this to work on an electric guitar, not just any old one but my favourite vintage and I suspect, I hope that it's going to work nicely and quickly. So this, um, what this is really good for is for quickly reprofiling your frets and I'm hoping that's what it's going to do. Having never used it on an electric guitar before, I'm going to trust that it does that, as well as the manual method that I relied on for so long. Um, I'm just going to I'm going to put my trust in this this time because uh, I've done a test earlier on and I think I'm confident in what this device does and I'm going to hope that it's good. It's, it'll make this job so much easier and quicker. I hope. In some ways it's not, I, I can see that although it is much quicker, it's not as precise in a functional way as doing it by hand. I suppose that is only to be expected. Um, doing something by a, an older way takes longer but you I guess have a bit more control over what's happening which is why it takes longer of course um, but I'm, you know, I'm looking for ways to achieve the same results but without spending quite so much time on each guitar um, and providing this works all round and achieves a good outcome then I'll be happy to use it on a continuous uh, basis but we'll only know when I've done the whole job uh, and the next stage after this is to um, go through the, the stages of polishing uh, the frets back up to a, a plain shine and that's where we're going to find out whether this is um, a good tool. It's not quite leaving me with a little black line the way I would achieve it by hand um, and it's not too bad. I think it takes off a lot less material than I would do, um, possibly because it's not it's not actually uh, profiling the fret quite as dramatically as I do by hand. Um, in a way, sort of not such a good thing um, because I, I like to know that I've re really reshaped it, and that's what I that's the result I get by hand. But it's fair to say this is considerably quicker. No way I would have, I would have been in about second or third fret now if I was doing this by hand. Um, My original objection to using one of these, or a similar, more expensive one of these, apart from the cost, was actually that um, a sort of concave file, as this is, uh, by definition, is always going to make some impact on the top of the fret. It's, it's not really feasible that it just takes away the sides. Uh, by its nature, the, the concave shape of it, the, the inside of the file is going to pretty soon come into contact with the very top of the fret. Uh, whereas with the, it's true, it's with the manual method, it doesn't do that because you, you are literally keeping the file away from the top of the fret, so you have absolute certainty that you haven't gone anywhere near it. 
and I'm not finding that with this and I'm not getting left with anywhere near a clear line down the centre that tells me that I've avoided. In fact on some of these last frets here I've left almost no black stuff down the middle. Um, but I'm going to take for, take for granted that I've levelled them without creating more problems. Um, and if I can just get the right length, I could probably confirm that. Seems good. Okay, so now we're into the, uh, the final stage, which is going to be the polishing part. And uh, with luck, um, when this is done, we will have a nice finish to, to go off. Now I'm going to use a couple of things to do this. I'm going to use some 600... No, Two, two lots of things. I'm going to use a bit of 320 paper, and this is quite abrasive, um, but it's very, very good. What we want to do is, on the very top of the frets, we want to take away the little scratches that were left by the fret file. And those scratches are quite extreme, so we've got to do quite a bit of work. Um, after that, I'm going to use a 600 paper which is in here somewhere. I have some, I know. And have a bit of this. And then after 600, we're going to go to um, a set of micro mesh papers, which are really, really go to a very high grit, which is perfect for finishing. So the thing here is starting with our 320. What we want to do is we want to get all the um, all the, all the any gouges out the top of the fret where the black paper, uh, black marker pen still is. We want to get that out, but without taking the height of the fret down too much. Or if we do take have to take the fret down, we take all of them down together. So we make sure that everything gets approximately the same treatment up and down the neck. So that it's a uniform coverage. going to do it by hand then. Let's, let's ride over the frets and up and down the side of them to kind of keep them round so we don't just recreate a flat spot. Okay and then I'm going to switch to uh, 600. This time I'm just going to quite a bit there. I'm just going to do it now by hand. 600 is still quite abrasive, so you don't want to do it too long on any one spot if you don't want to introduce um, more, more unevenness since we've just gone through all that trouble to cure it in the first place. But this 600 lets us just take out the last gouges. Okay, and then we now go to our, uh, I'm looking for a rubber, a foam block that's knocking it out here. What have I done with it? Foam block. Somewhere it's going for a walk. Uh, maybe it's one here. It's not the one I wanted, but anyway, ah, here it is. There you go. It's falling down the back out of sight. Remember to go out and chase that in a minute. So here we have, start with our 1500 and we're going to run right the way through a set all the way up to 12,000. And just on this one, when I'm here, I'm just going to run up and down the frets a bit on this one just to make sure any final nicks or gouges are taken out so that we don't have anything to catch the strings on later on. Okay, 
and then we move down, we've got 1800 next. Using these dry, if I use them wet it would um, churn all of that masking tape up with a bit of a muddy mess and we'll be through to the wood pretty quickly. Not too long on each one really, just enough to take a little bit off. And as you can tell we're getting progressively finer as we go, which means that our prep surfaces are coming to a shine. Uh, and then the final stage of this will be to give them a once over with some uh, polishing compound and the Dremel, which we've got somewhere ready to go. The nice thing about the micro mesh papers, of course, is once you keep them in order, you can pretty much forget what you're doing. You just keep them in order and pull them off one by one. And you know that you're going up through the grits. Now 6,000. I have um, some things here called a couple of things called fret rubbers. Quite interesting things. Worth having. Um, these two, uh, they come in different grades. The problem is I don't know what actual grades these are so I don't want to start using them on top of using these because I'll probably be taking it back a few stages. But if you don't have this uh, set up with micro mesh and all those things um, and you just want to bring your own frets back up on the guitar uh, you can pull the strings off to one side and use the coarse one first followed by the fine one and you'll get a pretty good um, shine and it will rejuvenate your frets but it won't level them of course it's not what they're for just to bring frets back to life a little bit okay so that's that done papers out of the way for another day and now we're into um, Dremel territory thank you I think about the Dremel we're going to use uh, just a bit of this number three polishing compound and I'm just going to put it on manually if I can get it out um, just a bit on each fret it doesn't need much the the Dremel is going to throw it around all over the place anyway so not much of it will ever go on the frets at the best of times but it just needs a bit so you can get some on the the um, polishing head um, and we're just going to go over all of these frets to give them the final brush up. And the most important part of this job is to ensure that you don't clank the metal chuck or whatever it's called against the fret. You'll be starting again. So it gets a bit messy um, but it will give the frets a really nice polish. It spits it everywhere so you need to you will need to clean this neck down properly afterwards. I think we're set it on four. Again, this is where your masking tape really does protect the, um, the, the fingerboard. Uh, without this, you'd make a mess on the fingerboard. So. so hopefully, thanks to the Chris Allsop's fabulous, well, hopefully fabulous, uh, fret crowning tool. Um, we'll have saved quite a bit of time in this job now. I'm hoping.
bit low. I have a tiny clip there. Just going to double check right on the edge. So we got away with that. See, that's what we have to watch out for. Got my angle slightly too low. Okay, so we're done, and as you can see, it's a bright old mess. So our next game is to take all the masking tape off. Again, take your time, because the temptation to go and get a knife to do this may be quite strong, but resist it. You need to do this um, as carefully as you can, and no knives anywhere. And yes, it's dirty, and yes, you will need to clean your neck afterwards. But, you will see the benefits of having taken the time to do it. And uh, you'll be very pleased with what you get out of it. Sparkly frets, and more importantly, complete level frets. Which will be the first time your guitar has ever had them from the factory. Unless possibly, if you, if you come out the... I don't know, the Fender Custom Shop or something. Maybe that's that's done there. I'd love to get hold of one uh, and try it out. I did have a, a go, uh, did set up my brother's uh, custom shop, Telecaster, a couple of months ago now. And uh, I seem to remember having encountered some uh, uneven frets, even on that one. So, so far, my experience is 100% of guitars have these problems uh, and in my limited experience of custom shop guitars not even being custom shop and paying how many thousands of pounds will save you from that. Now I'm still annoyed with this a little bit because I've still got a problem when I'm doing this with the marker pen bleeding through so I'm going to have to change my technique no matter what I do it somehow seems to bleed through and get onto the fingerboard um, which is not the end of the world, but it's not what I hoped for. Um, just a couple of places, um, and I'll need to get some, probably some lighter fuel on that and try and just ease it out. Um, I don't want to do anything abrasive, because obviously I've already done all that hard work. I don't want to mess the frets up. As I said, it even bleeds through there. How does it do that? I've masked this off. Right, so a bit of process improvement required, as you can see, it's gone through both sides, amazing. You live and you keep on learning. I guess I will, uh, may use, I think the secret may well be using the marker pen only for the tops of the frets and revert to something inert, safe like pencil for everything else. I think that's probably what I'm going to do next time. Um, there we go. Like I say, you live and learn. So a big pile of grotty stuff. Um, and then we want to give this a good clean. And there's going to be sticky stuff on the back of it as well. Um, not sure where the... We seem to have lost all the, the household polish at the moment. It's gone back in the house, I think, probably. It's a bit smart thing for it to do. 
Um, but let's see if the, the lighter fluid works on this kind of stuff. It's supposed to be this, this naphtha is supposed to be a, a good solvent that's safe for lacquer, which is doing the job okay actually. Um, I can see it taking all the goo off without damaging any lacquer. I've, I've used in, in previous videos, I have used some alcohol, rubbing alcohol. Um, for example, rubbing alcohol will come out of, will take the black off the, the pen off those, so that lacquer much easier, and I might go to do that in a minute. But somebody quite rightly pointed out that um, it's much better to use lighter fluid if, if you're going to be working with uh, guitar lacquer. It's just far less likely to damage the finish, far le less likely to chemically interact as well. So I've got a bit of work to do to get this marker pen off. I'm um, um, sure I'll be able to do it. A bit of elbow grease. Um, and then we'll have ourselves a very nicely finished, clean, vintage guitar neck. As I say, a bit of, bit of work on that, the uh, marker that's bled through. Um, this naphtha doesn't seem to have much effect on that, so it may have to be a bit of alcohol. So, a few bits of marker pen notwithstanding, that have left me with some work to do. The basics of our re-leveled frets is all nicely cleaned up and done. So, beautifully levelled in a way that you've never had before, and some blodges to clean up. Okay, so that's the job done. Thanks to Chris Allsop's new tool, quicker than new, normal. And um, next stage is to uh, put this neck back together and then re-string it and then make some adjustments to the nut and to the playing height uh, and to see how this nicely levelled neck now feels on the guitar itself. Um, as I say, <sighs> just goes to show that even the best quality guitars that I've seen on the market at the moment also have problems, um, uneven frets, as do uh, the custom shop vendors, which I've seen and done some work on myself. So you know, every guitar has them. And what you get when you don't have high frets is um, you have the ability to play, uh, to, to lower your action and have a much better playing action than if you were trying to accommodate uh, uneven frets. Because uneven frets makes you have to set your action higher than you'd ideally want to, and there's no, no way around it. Okay, amazing. Take, take some elbow grease to rub this out. We'll get there.